uh, our newly hired PhD student, Valerian Hrytonov, also junior researcher in the joint lab uh, HLC Samsung, uh, who will give a talk about our recent submission to, to what? To ISTATS. To ISTATS, right. Uh, about um, semi implicit uh, variational inference, and that's it. Good. <laughs> okay, uh, let's start. Hi, everyone. Uh, today's talk is going to be uh, a follow up talk to uh, the first talk of our uh, seminar this year, given by Dima Mulchanov. Uh, so, Dima told us about uh, variational inference with uh, implicit distributions and uh, he uh, described uh, several methods, um, and um, so, so he described several methods uh, for implicit variation inference. And today I'm going to uh, add a couple of methods to that toolbox. So uh, my talk consists of three parts. Uh, first, I will tell you about a recent paper from. Uh, the University of Texas at Austin, uh, some implicit variational inference, CV for short. Um, and um, the paper proposed a way to use implicit distributions as approximate posteriors. Uh, second, I will present our uh, latest paper with uh, Dmitry Molchanov, Artem Sobolev, and Dmitry Retrov, uh, doubly semi implicit variational inference, um, which, is, which I will call uh, short. Um, DCV for short, uh, that extends the former approach and allows for variational inference not only with uh, some implicit approximate posteriors but also with the uh, implicit priors. Uh, the paper has been submitted to AI Stats uh, 2019 and the preprint is available at archive. And third, I will tell you about the applications for uh, implicit variational inference and uh, show you some uh, experimental results. Okay, so let's quickly recap um, the problem we're trying to solve here. Uh, variational inference uh, tries to uh, approximate the posterior distribution over the latent variables using uh, some optimization problem. Uh, we try to optimize elbow with respect to uh, the parameters of some uh, uh, some approximate posterior distributions q, phi uh, of z given x. Uh, this distribution belongs to some parametric family, and uh, we usually use uh, fully factorized Gaussian distributions, for example, uh, or some other sim simple family uh, that we can uh, efficiently uh, assemble from and compute uh, the density for. Um, and variational learning is a more general problem uh, where we try to approximately maximize the marginal log likelihood, uh, log p of x given theta and chi, uh, where theta are the parameters of the likelihood p of x given z, and chi are the parameters of the prior distribution over the latent variables. So the difference here is just that in the first um, in the first case, we don't need to optimize with respect to parameters of the likelihood because we don't have any parameters or the prior for that matter. Um, so, as I told um, a couple of seconds ago, uh, it's often the case that the approximate posterior distribution is fully factorized Gaussian, but it's a very restrictive case. So. Uh, there is a promising direction of research trying to come up with more flexible posterior distributions. So for example, you could try to use uh, normalizing flows for that, or uh, if you want to have even more flexible uh, families, you may need uh, implicit distributions. So uh, let's uh, remember what implicit distributions are. So we call a distribution implicit if we can sample from it, but there is no closed form density available. Uh, so, um, uh, that's uh, the case when, for example, we have some non-parametric noise, and we uh, put it into a neural network, and we get some output. We don't know the density of the output, the, the output samples, but we can still sample from that implicit distribution. In particular, we call a distribution Q5Z semi-implicit, if it can be represented as the following integral. 
that's that integral is uh, basically a, an infinite mixture of the conditional distributions q uh, phi of z given psi uh, with the, some mixing density q phi of psi. Here we uh, we would like to have uh, q of z given psi to be analytically tractable, and uh, both the, those distributions uh, z of uh, q of z given psi and q of psi uh, should be reparameterizable. Um, any <coughs> implicit distribution can actually be approximated with the same implicit distribution arbitrarily well. Uh, so if we could just uh, have a conditional which is uh, a Gaussian with some variance uh, sigma squared, uh, where sigma squared uh, is arbitrarily uh, small. And when, uh, when it's exactly zero, we just get a delta function here, and this integral is just, uh, just gives us uh, the exact uh, equality, we just get uh, the q phi of z. Um, so, any questions? I guess not. Uh, if we can efficiently sample from q phi uh, of psi, it is easy to sample from q phi of z. We just sample from uh, the distribution over psi, and then uh, we can uh, use that to get some uh, conditional distribution over z, and then sample from it. Um, so, for example, it could be uh, so Q of psi could be the output of some neural network, where epsilon is a sample from some non-parametric noise, uh, and phi are the parameters of the neural network. Uh, so, if both of those distributions are parameterizable, then we can uh, easily uh, compute gradients with respect to uh, phi, because uh, well, we just apply a representation trick uh, at, uh, for both uh, sampling, for bro both sampling steps. Um, so, um, why do we uh, need uh, some implicit distributions? Right, uh, so let's get back here. Uh, even if uh, q phi of z given psi and q of psi are both um, very simple, uh, or um, I would say, uh, if, if the conditional distribution is simple, for example, normal distribution, and q phi of psi is some complex distribution, we actually get some very complex distribution, which is a mixture, and uh, even though we cannot uh, compute the density here uh, of z, we still can compute the, the density of the conditional distribution. Okay. So and what are the benefits of using semi-implicit inference instead of uh, full implicit inference? So when uh, when we are in a fully implicit setting, we don't have any densities, right? right. We will have the density of the uh, noise, and that may also be. Uh, feasible to work with, uh, but it's just um, so uh, same implicit variational inference uh, is concerned with the this with the with this formulation because it's uh, we can actually use the fact that we have this density to estimate uh, the elbow just to, bond, to bond the elbow from below. Right. Yeah. So this is this is the main advantage. So this is a. Uh, so some kind of compromise between explicit distributions and fully implicit distributions. Yeah. Uh, by using some implicit variational inference, we're able to, to estimate elbow and to optimize with respect to it, uh, which we cannot do if we use fully implicit distributions, like for example on GANs, when we need to, to have some alternative uh, learning method. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to tell you about uh, the methods that, uh, that were presented by Dima. So, uh, uh, we discussed discriminator-based uh, density ratio estimation and approaches based on reverse models. And uh, both of those methods have some drawbacks. So for discriminator, so, so for both of those uh, points, we have uh, the, the drawback that we can't actually have implicit priors and we can't optimize for uh, their parameters. Uh, so we cannot perform variational learning in that setting with some implicit priors or implicit priors. Uh, and uh, the discriminator-based approaches are biased. 
uh, they just optimize something which is not actually elbow, uh, just approximates it. And uh, we don't have uh, much guarantees in that case. Uh, and also, uh, density ratio methods are uh, known to perform poorly in uh, high dimensional settings, so um, that's, uh, that may also be a problem if we would like to apply uh, the technique to Bayesian neural networks where our latent space is quite large. Um, so today we're going to discuss doubly semi implicit variation inference and semi implicit variation inference, um, which uh, which is actually uh, which actually tries to solve uh, the, both of those, those problems. Um, we uh, so okay um, yeah let's move on. What's semi implicit variation inference? So how can we perform any kind of variational inference with the semi-implicit approximation of posterior. Uh, the, problem, the main problem with the implicit distributions is that we cannot uh, compute uh, the uh, we cannot compute this density here, right? So if we cannot compute it exactly, we might try to approximate it. And we, in some implicit variational inference, we just approximate it with the Monte Carlo set. We just say that let's take k samples uh, of uh, the auxiliary variable psi and just uh, average over uh, those samples. So we, we have uh, the conditional density and we can approximate this integral uh, using Monte Carlo. So that's the basic idea, but it's not so uh, trivial to apply it uh, uh, in a straightforward way because if we just plug it in into album we get an upper bound in album. We can easily see that with the Janssen's inequality. So, uh, if we plug it in as it is, uh, we can uh, we can see that uh, it's actually we, we can uh, use Janssen's inequality to see that it's actually um, bounded below by elbow. Uh, so this expectation goes into the logarithm, and the expectation of this sum is equal for each term, and this expectation is uh, actually the marginal density of Q of Z. And that's exactly the elbow. Uh, so, yeah. The expectation you, is the second expectation. Yeah, the you second. Should, you should have a product over all psi 0, psi 1, etc. No, in, in this case it's just uh, psi 0. Um, it's just if we uh, take an expectation uh, over psi zero first and then over z given psi zero, we just get the marginal expectation. So what? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it's just uh, first we take uh, the expectation of psi zero, then over the conditional z given <coughs> psi zero. So uh, in the end, it's just uh, the expectation over uh, z marginal z. Uh, and yeah, so uh, and the the rest is just goes away because uh, it doesn't depend on uh, psi one psi k anymore because we just take the expectation uh, over z. Uh, they're all equal. Yeah. Well, so this gives us an upper bound on elbow. Uh, this upper bound has some nice properties. It's actually monotonic uh, with respect to k, um, and it's uh, asymptotically exact. So when k is infinite, we just get uh, our elbow. That just, uh, that just uh, follows from uh, the law of large numbers. Because this is actually... Uh, this uh, averaging yeah. converts yeah. to expectation. Yeah. To expectation with respect to q of psi. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, how do we derive a lower bound on elbow? If we have a lower bound, we can optimize it, uh, and we can hope that uh, that optimizes our elbow. So, this is actually a lower bound. Can anyone spot the difference here between the two objectives? 
the summation goes from zero. Yeah, yeah, and the coefficient is, is different. Yeah. So uh, here we uh, have a sum over psi 1, mm. psi k, and we don't have psi uh, 0 here. Psi 0 is uh, the, the one that, uh, psi 0 is the one that we use to get z, right? We don't have it here. And here we have it. That's the only difference. So we uh, just take the sum uh, using uh, psi 0 as well. And that gives us uh, a lower bound. That's actually not so easy to see. It's not enough to just apply against its inequality here. Um, but yeah, this lower bound is also asymptotically exact uh, for the same reason. And it is also monotonic. But can you give the intuition of why um, upper bound became lower bound after we added one more term in averaging? So, um, I'm gonna give you um, some kind of an intuition. Um, oh, please do. Yeah. So, we, of course, we use it as a surrogate to, to maximize the elbow. So, we can actually rewrite this lower yeah. bound as follows. Uh, so, the first expression and the second expression are very similar, again. We just, first we uh, rename our sum and uh, make a new notation here. But there's also another thing that differs here. Can anyone spot the difference again? Um, what, what's, what changed apart from this term? We changed the distribution. Yeah. The expectation. Yeah, we take the expectation uh, with respect to another distribution. Not with respect to uh, z given uh, psi zero, but with respect to the whole uh, Mix, uh, the whole uh, mixture distribution. And that's uh, actually v quite easy to see because uh, we have some kind of symmetry here, right? It's, it's actually, it doesn't matter uh, with respect to which psi we take expectation, right? It, it's just... With respect to, to which, which psi we psi condition. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We condition, yeah. So if we replace zero with the, any other index, we just get the same expectation. Mm -hmm. And uh, since they're all equal, we can just sum them up and it gives us exactly this distribution. If we just write it uh, as an integral, this expectation write it as an integral, we get exactly what we'd like to see here. So we, uh, if we average all over all uh, representations of this uh, expression with respect to all uh, psi, psi k. Mm, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the distributions are different. The distributions. The distribution q of, z, q of z given psi, whatever it is, psi 0, psi 1, psi k, but just single psi. Yeah. It's different from the distribution of a mixture of k plus 1, different q of z given psi. That's true, yeah. Yeah, but um, the well, the expectations are equal with respect to that. It's just mm -hmm. uh, I would mm -hmm. let me see if I can bring uh, something like a whiteboard here. We can try to use that whiteboard, but it's like not very convenient. But, um, the reason is the linearity of expectation. Yeah, it's just linearity of the expectation. It's just uh, if we right. look at it as an integral, uh, just we just have this term. Uh, in front of this, right? Mm -hmm. And we just get, if we average overall uh, psi, we, 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 we get this. Yeah. It, it's, uh, so we can uh, write it as false as a sum of a k plus one different expectations. Yeah. And all expectations will be the same. Yeah. And that's why, although the distributions are different, the expectation will be the same. Exactly. Good. Yeah. So. Uh, so actually, if we look closer at this expression, uh, we may see that if we like look at the second expectation only, it's actually elbow in some other model. It's just when we not not some other model, but with a, a different uh, posterior family. So uh, if we don't have this expectation, we have some fixed psi zero psi k. Mm -hmm. Uh, our approximation is actually a mixture, and this term is exactly the elbow 
for such an approximation family. And in the end, this lower bound is actually an expectation over all such mixtures of uh, the elbow for a finite mixture model. Uh, yeah. So that, that's uh, a fun fact, actually. Yeah. But it's still uh, maybe hard to see why this is a lower bound, right? Well, but I think you, you, you've now uh, given us well, complete explanations. Yeah, well... Uh, so because this is... Uh, these guys are our with respect to this distribution, and uh, this is the distribution with respect to which we compute the uh, expectation. So this is, this is standard power, just for such kind of a bit ex uh, strange distribution. Yeah. Uh, but please return to the previous slide. I would like to give some more uh, intuitive explanations. So here we see the only difference with the previous upper bound is the um, the term here with k equal to zero, right? And this is exactly the, the, the distribution from which we generate z. So we say that uh, uh, if, we, if we generated z from this distribution, and now we compute the probability density function of q of z given different size, it will be the largest when psi equals to psi zero, because this particular z was generated from the distribution condition by psi zero. So it will be the largest term here. So all other terms with different size probably will have a quite low values of density. And this is why when we subtract additional term, which is probably the largest one, uh, we switch from our bound to our bound. So this value became, uh, becomes significantly less than the previous one. Because uh, the largest item here responds to k equal to zero. So this is again, uh, no strict explanation, but some intuitive explanation. Um, okay, let's move on, I guess. Um, so I'm not, I think I'm not going to write down the whole uh, proof why this is a lower bound, why it is uh, monotonic, but it's uh, not so hard to see just subtracting uh, the lower bound from the elbow, and we will get just the expected KL divergence between <coughs> the mixture and the true marginal distribution. And that's why it's not negative, and that's why we actually have a lower bound. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm just going to write down that what we'd like to compute. We just compute the elbow minus uh, L uh, underline KQ, and actually it will give us some expectation uh, of the KL divergence between uh, Q uh, phi k of z given psi uh, zero k and Q phi of z, and that's not negative. And the expectation is taken with respect to all sides. Mm -hmm. It's just like simple algebra. Okay, um, so since we have both a lower bound and an upper bound on the elbow, uh, we can use them together to evaluate how well we approximate the elbow on convergence or during uh, training. And furthermore, we can use the sandwich to evaluate not only models that are trained using CV, but also uh, any other models. Uh, for example, if we use semi-implicit distributions with uh, some discriminative, uh, uh, some discriminator-based models, we get some approximate posterior. Uh, we can use uh, the CV bound, CV uh, lower bound, and CV upper bound uh, to evaluate how well uh, that approach works. Um, that's quite nice, I guess. <laughs> Uh, you say that you have up about low bound, yeah. but uh, uh, you can analytically estimate this uh, semi distillers or not? Um, so we don't have the density, right? So we don't have. Uh... So you use stochastic estimator, but. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, sure. Uh, then if you use stochastic estimator, how do you uh, uh, distinguish it? Yeah, low and up and down because it's variance. Okay, it, uh, the point here is yeah, it's a good question. 
uh, it's not maybe not so clear how to uh, compute uh, the uh, values exactly, uh, but it's actually if you just subtract the upper the lower bound from the upper bound, just rearrange some expectations, uh, you would get a much smaller variance uh, uh, in. Uh, so, now, um, so what I'm trying to say is that the upper bound and the lower bound, they only differ here uh, by one term. If we take the same samples to evaluate uh, both the lower bound and the upper bound, the same psi 0, psi k, uh, we will actually uh, get some non-negative value, right? Some, some gap. Some, this gap um, we can uh, average over many such samples and get some uh, reasonable estimate on the gap between the lower bound and the upper bound. Also, I would like to add that uh, in many cases uh, the evidence lower bound, although it is estimated stochastically, uh, this estimate does not have very high variance. And for example, in all papers on variational autoencoders, uh, the authors report uh, either the evidence lower bound or the I uh, importance weight bound uh, on the test likelihood and uh, compare these numbers among different variational out reporters and they can do it because the variance is usually very low. But on the same side, uh, it's no significant increase in uh, in whatever when you make in any way when you make samples of k. Yes? Mm. So you can do it if for... If you use the key in the IYK10 or KY100 or KY1000, yeah. it's not a significant increase. Well, relatively quite much. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes. For example, if your MSO bound may be like something like minus 90 and IY bound is like minus 80. Ah. Mm -hmm. It increases very much. And the variance is very slow, it's very low, much lower than that. But it's right because it means that you decrease in, in the same way bias and variance. And usually there is trade off. Mm. Well, uh, why, why would we discuss bias and variance here? Uh, well, it's just expectations, right? If we take a sufficiently large sample, we get sufficiently exact result, right? Uh, we just, uh, yeah, the variance uh, reduces as a inverse square root of the number of samples, right? Something like that. but. Uh, the bias is zero. Yeah, well, it's unbiased. Well, uh, it's unbiased and uh, the variance can be reduced by using the same samples uh, when we compute the gap between upper and lower bounds, just like for, uh, for as what I told. For each case, there is a uh, bias between uh, yeah. lower bound and actual likelihood because it's oh, yeah. lower bound. Yeah. Uh, this is a bias of the system. Uh, so the, the elbow, of course, is biased uh, with respect to like the marginal likelihood. Yeah. It's, it's lower. But and making more samples, you will reduce this bias. More? No, 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 no. no. It's not. It's not uh, about uh, the bias uh, in the elbow. This k is actually, the, the larger k is the, the closer we get to the elbow, not the log, the, the log likelihood. Not the marginal likelihood, <coughs> but the elbow. Uh -huh. it, it's not the elbow, it's just the lower bound in it, right? And uh, if we take a sufficiently large k, we get the elbow. So it's a lower bound and a lower bound on the marginal likelihood. That's why increasing k doesn't help us uh, getting closer to marginal likelihood than we would have. And we would, um, be uh, if we just take the exact elbow. Yeah. So uh, we can evaluate the elbow, right? Uh, it's a proxy metric, right? We, we don't have anything <coughs> better. Well, we have importance weighted, uh, importance weighted uh, estimates, and we actually use it during test time. Uh, but yeah, uh, the idea is the same. Okay, so uh, how can we um, extend this approach to use it for? Uh, some implicit priors. Well, we just use the same idea. And surprisingly, this gives us uh, the lower bound uh, right away. Because the Jensen's inequality now works uh, in a different direction, because we have a plus here instead of a minus, and we just get a lower bound on the elbow. So it's 
this, exactly the same idea as for the upper bound uh, in the case of semi implicit posteriors, but we uh, have a semi implicit prior now, so we get a lower bound. And we can immediately use uh, this lower bound as a surrogate for elbow optimization. Um, okay. Uh, again, this bound has the same nice properties. It's uh, monotonic with respect to k, and it, it is asymptotically exact. But unfortunately, this time we can't have an upper bound because, uh, well, uh, it's uh, to, to, it's we can estimate the cross entropy here uh, from uh, above. So we may need to resort to some other methods for uh, estimating the KL divergence. So, uh, it is known that uh, we can uh, represent any f divergence as a uh, something like that. Uh, wait, 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 wait a minute, can you explain why? Why, why can't we get uh, upper bound anymore? Just uh, uh, why, why can't we use uh, lower bound and lower bound and obtain the same idea to get upper bound for the, for the prior? So, in the previous case, we uh, sampled uh, psi k and used those samples to sample z, right? Right. And here we don't sample from the prior. Right. We, we don't have any expectations with respect to prior, and that's why the same technique doesn't work. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, but we can do something different. We can use something like. Uh, so, uh, is it Fenchel conjugate? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, it's Fenchel it's conjugate uh, for, uh, for the divergence. Okay, well, whatever. Uh, that's, uh, we can uh, represent a, a KL divergence uh, in this way. We take the supremum over all functions G uh, defined on uh, the support of uh, distributions, the, the common support of the distributions P of Q and Q. Uh, and uh, this is actually an upper bound uh, for any uh, subfamily of functions defined on the same domain. So, for example, we can use uh, some neural network G parameterized by eta, uh, which acts as a discriminator in some way, like a discriminator in Gans, or more closely, like a discriminator in Wasserstein Gans. Um, and uh, we can train this uh, network to estimate the KL divergence. However, uh, this actually might not work very well. Um, well, uh, first of all, this formula is not very uh, nice because we have to train a neural network, a uh, whole neural network to estimate uh, the KL divergence. And uh, this training process is highly unstable if uh, the two distributions uh, differ significantly because, well, uh, it's yeah, so um, because of the exponent here um, and the difference here, we might get um, very large numbers of uh, this difference, uh, large values of this difference. And, uh, well, in high dimensions, uh, this doesn't really work well, as our experiments show. In many cases, you just obtain some negative number. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, you just can about it from the law by a negative number, but it is not very satisfying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, if we have a, if we train a good enough discriminator, we might get something useful from it. So uh, combining the two approaches, uh, when we have both semi-implicit priors and semi-implicit approximate series, we obtain uh, the following bound. Uh, so it's uh, a lower bound on a lower bound on a lower bound on a marginal likelihood. Um, and uh, we use it for optimization. Um, and we can use the variational representation of the Kelvernus uh, from the previous slide to estimate uh, the upper bound, to obtain an upper bound and uh, to obtain some kind of a sandwich in that case. So, how do we actually approach it in practice? How do we compute uh, the gradients of this uh, with respect to the branches uh, phi and theta? So, well, basically we use the same techniques as in doubly stochastic variational inference, 
all our distributions are uh, reparameterizable, uh, so we can obtain a biased uh, estimate uh, for the gradients. Uh, we just use Monte Carlo samples. And we use some uh, sufficiently large number of K1 and K2 uh, to get a sufficiently good approximation for, uh, for, those, densities, for those marginal de densities. I think you forgot plus one. The no, it's term. minus one here. No, 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 I uh, mean uh, in the elbow. In the K1 elbow. plus one. Oh, yeah, 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 it should be K1 plus one. Yeah, that's true. Because, yeah, yeah the summation is uh, for K1 plus one uh, terms. Okay, so. Um, let's move on to the applications. Why would we need that? Well, first, why would we need uh, implicit priors, right? That might not be uh, obvious, but first um, I'm going to tell you about uh, variational inference with hierarchical priors. It's, all, uh, it's uh, often the case that uh, we, we're not satisfied with just uh, some uh, priors, which has a lot of hyperparameters, and we would like to have a prior on hyperparameters to perform a variational inference uh, on, in a hierarchical model. Um, so uh, the, the examples will be further. Uh, I will also tell you about uh, variational autoencoders with uh, semi-implicit priors and posteriors. And actually, uh, using using uh, semi-implicit priors improves current state of the art for uh, fully connected uh, variational autoencoders on a mist. Um, and I will not tell you about uh, the last two points, but I just uh, want to mention them. So, uh, during the previous talk, uh, Andre uh, told you about the deep weight prior. Um, actually, deep weight prior is a semi implicit distribution, so we can use semi implicit variational inference uh, to uh, perform inference uh, in that model instead of hierarchical variational inference. And that might also give us uh, some benefits. Uh, and uh, another one uh, is incremental learning. In uh, deep neural networks. Uh, that's something we tried but haven't yet uh, been successful in uh, getting it to work. So um, incremental learning is uh, when your data arrives in, uh, in chunks. So uh, for example your data set is quite large and you cannot store it uh, and uh, you get like first uh, thousand samples you want to get some uh, approximate posterior distribution of over uh, the parameters of your neural network using just the first thousand samples and then use uh, the obtained uh, distribution as a new prior for the next part. Uh, so uh, if we want to have uh, some flexible uh, approximate posterior family, uh, for example some implicit uh, approximate posterior uh, we also need some implicit priors, because uh, our previous posterior becomes a new prior, so we, we just <coughs> need to be able to use such uh, flexible priors as well. Uh, okay, so let's discuss the first two points in detail. So, uh, in uh, discriminative models, it is common to uh, specify hyperprior over the hyperparameters of the prior. So we have, uh, uh, we have the joint uh, distribution over the targets T, uh, <coughs> some parameters <coughs> W, and hyperparameters alpha, even some object X, uh, which factorizes as, uh, well, like this. Here we have the likelihood, here we have uh, the prior given the hyperparameters and the prior over the hyperparameters. How do we usually approach this problem? Well, we, uh, <coughs> we can approximate the joint posterior. So, uh, if we just uh, introduce some parametric family Q, Q phi, uh, we, can, um, we can perform inference in the joint model, and then uh, for prediction we may use uh, the marginal approximate posterior. We just marginalize out our alphas uh, and get some approximate posterior over W. So, yeah, here we just have uh, the posterior predictive distribution. We uh, 
we, we, we want to have some uh, posterior over the parameters, but we don't have that, so we integrate out the higher parameters. But this we can uh, approximate with our uh, approximate distribution Q, and uh, just use uh, this um, to predict our uh, new values, to predict new values of our target for uh, a new object. But uh, it might not be something that we would really like to do. Because, well, we are only interested here in uh, the, uh, the distribution over the parameters. We're not interested in the distribution over the hyperparameters, right? So why would we do joint inference here? Uh, so the objective for joint inference looks like this. So here we have the joint uh, distribution over parameters and uh, the hyperparameters and uh, the approximate posterior. But what we really want to have is something like this. We can uh, actually regard our prior over the parameters as a semi-implicit prior. Now, posterior might also be semi-implicit. So here, it, this expression just works uh, always. It's just how we define uh, P of W. Uh, P of W uh, alpha, and we just integrate it out, um, and we just uh, introduce some uh, parametric family Q again, and uh, we can use semi double semi-implicit variational inference to uh, directly uh, optimize uh, for the parameters of the marginal posterior. So it turns out that... But these two problems are different. Um, not so exactly. If you uh, have two distributions that are similar uh, in both parameters, it doesn't mean that you uh, do the same with marginals. Well, what we really want to have is a marginal, right? Uh, we, we're not concerned with the, the hyperparameters. So, so basically what you do when you uh, perform conditions on your test set, you first approximate the joint posterior and then marginalize the approximations and then use it for prediction. However, we would like to first so to first marginalize the joint posterior and then to approximate the marginal posterior and then use it for predictions. So the difference is uh, in what we're approximating. Yeah. We may approximate yeah. either the joint or the marginals. Yeah. And actually we're interested in marginals. So it seems at least promising to try approximating marginals directly. Yeah, that's a different problem, right? Uh, we, we have some different functional to optimize. <coughs> but uh, it turns out that if we have uh, those two functionals and we have phi j and phi m, which maximize the joint and the marginal elbow correspondingly. Then the KL divergence between the approximate uh, posterior in the marginal case is less than or equal to the KL divergence, the KL divergence between the approximate posterior, approximate marginal posterior for W, and the true posterior of W is less than or equal to the Kelly divergence uh, between uh, the marginal posterior that we get in the case of the joint problem and the true posterior. Well, if we want to have uh, some good posterior distribution of uh, the weights, W, then we, we are better uh, using, we would better use uh, the marginal objective. Well, the concept is pretty clear because uh, when we marginal, uh, when we optimizing our marginal, we're doing exactly, we're exactly uh, minimizing the the left hand side expression, right? Yeah. While well, when we optimize, uh, please return. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, when we optimizing our joint, uh, we're not optimizing the, the the right hand part expression. We're optimizing some different KL divergences between our joint distributions. But the details and details. Uh, so the theorem is, is is true. If we in some sense, working in, in, in within the same family of marginal distributions, Q of W. That's true. <coughs> and it should be stated well, clearly somewhere. Mm, so, yeah, uh, we basically here we, um, well, it's, it's, uh, we just have some, for example, we have some joint, right? In right. both cases, we have some joint. Yeah. Yeah. And we suppose that this joint is the same. Mm -hmm. And that's the only. Uh, the only thing. Right, yeah. exactly. That's, that, yeah, that's implicit in the not notation because well, we have mm -hmm. Q, 5, W, and alpha, 
uh, well, it's, it's the joint, and this one is the marginal. So yeah. it's marginal from the same oh, family of joint yeah, distribution. Yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, oh, that's not the right slides. Okay. So uh, we could uh, actually illustrate that uh, on some, well, on some real problem. So. Suppose that we have um, a probabilistic model uh, defined in the same way as previously, but uh, we have P of uh, W given alpha for each weight um, is, is actually, uh, is actually normal uh, with the mean equal to zero and inverse uh, variance equal to alpha. And suppose that P of alpha i is follows gamma distribution uh, with parameters a equal to 0 0.5 and b equal to 2. And P uh, t given w X is a neural network uh, from NIST. So, uh, and then on NIST. Um, so, actually, our uh, marginal prior is student prior with a one degree of freedom. It's uh, it's one of the definitions of student distribution. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually have a semi-implicit uh, prior here, right? And we can uh, consider three different tasks. Uh, first, we may consider joint uh, joint variational inference, just like on the previous slide. Second, we may consider marginal inference, uh, since we have a tractable uh, marginal prior here, it's just a student distribution. We may use it directly, or we might just use it and sample uh, our, uh, we use uh, Monte Carlo samples to estimate our KL divergence between the prior and the, between the posterior and the prior. And the third case is doubly semi implicit variational inference, of course. And we would like to compare those three techniques. So uh, we expect that. Uh, we cannot do better than marginal because it's uh, we just directly optimize the necessary elbow. Uh, so let's look at the pictures. So we train a neural network on MNIST, a fully connected neural network, uh, with the yeah, and the the posterior here. I forgot about the posterior is a fully factorized fully factorized Gaussian. It's just normal uh, with some mu i and sigma i. So yeah, it's not exactly uh, doubly semi implicit variation. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, only variational inference with uh, semi implicit prior. Right. And this is log normal uh, with uh, some parameters. Over alpha. Hmm? Over alpha. Over alpha. Over alpha. Yeah. alpha. Uh, and we have like not M and S. Yep. Um, M I I which is separate for each. Yeah, it's for each. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, we obtained the following results. Uh, of course, uh, the marginal is. Uh, pretty high, and it's higher than the joint, because we, uh, when we do a joint inference, uh, we uh, actually increase the gap between the elbow and the marginal like the hook. And DCV with the k equal to two already outperforms uh, joint inference, and when we take k equal to ten, we just uh, get uh, as well as we can. We we just uh, get the same performance as uh, for the marginal inference. 
What was the dimension of W's in this problem? Uh, it was... Uh, Approximately. Uh, so the neural network was... Tens of thousands. Yeah. 784, 300, 100, 10. Right? So it's... I can't multiply so quickly. It's okay. 100,000. Right? Mm -hmm. right. Uh, I don't know that all these distributions are one dimensional, you know? So there are no multi dimensional distributions. Mm -hmm. All Carol divisions, Carol divisions yeah. are one dimensional. Mm -hmm. We just uh, do inference uh, separately for each week, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to also use the same implicit posteriors in variation multi encoders. So this section about, is about uh, the experiments in uh, the CV paper. So they uh, they have a variation multi encoder with the multiple stochastic layers in the posterior. Um, so their posterior is actually semi implicit, where mu and sigma are not deterministic as previously, as in uh, normal variation multi encoders, but they're uh, stochastic uh, maps from the input and some parameters of phi. Uh, that's actually just implemented as a several stochastic layers uh, in the encoder. So what we have here is some input x, uh, we have some stochastic uh, layers L1, uh, L2, etc. Um, and the last one is uh, L. Uh, M and from uh, LM we just get mu and sigma. Sorry, what is the size of sigma? Is it a fully a full matrix? No, it's 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 a fully factorized Gaussian. It's a oh, our, it's a diagonal. Hmm? It's diagonal. Yeah, di di sigma is diagonal, right? Yeah. Uh, so here we just have a normal uh, uh, normal decoder. So uh, this one is uh, T1, T2, Tm, and we have epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon m, right? Here we have, uh, yeah, well, F and G. No, it's not F and G. So, um, in this case, we get uh, a semi implicit distribution uh, Q phi of z given x, with marginalized uh, mu and sigma. Um, so it might be more expressive than a fully factorized Gauss. Uh, so that's the table from the CV paper. They have a standard normal prior as a vanilla variation order encoder. And they compare to various methods that also use this prior. So they compare to Gordon's weighted <coughs> autoencoders, they compare it to normalizing flows, um, to auxiliary uh, variables, to, uh, to um, adversarial variational weights. So they get pretty good results. The no, more the better. Hmm? Lower no. level, yeah, that's uh, negative uh, mm -hmm. level, I think. What Clo is the name HVI? HVI <laughs> is a uh, hierarchical variation of course. Yeah, that, that's hierarchical variation. And why the proc is inside here? I'm not quite sure about the details. Okay. Um, okay, so the results are pretty good. Uh, I think it is from the vision the gap paper. And they use some application C in there and they use the proc integration to approximate. Yeah. Yes. I think it is about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, Okay, well, we, we can not only uh, have implicit posterior distributions, but also simple priors. Uh, why would we do that? Uh, well, uh, the main reason is that 
standard normal prior in variation of encoders was shown to be not so uh, well working uh, for various reasons. For example, it um, makes uh, it over regularizes the model and uh, makes uh, the lat latent uh, uh, latent uh, representation uh, sparse. And um, well, uh, for that reason, uh, there were beta v uh, introduced and some other models. But uh, current state of the art uh, for VAE uh, on MNIST, for example, is uh, VAMP prior. So it can be shown that the so-called aggregated posterior distribution is actually the optimal prior uh, for a variational encoder in terms of the value of elbow. So uh, it's just a mixture of all posteriors for each object in the data set. If we use such prior, we get the, low, the, the highest value of elbow, if we optimize it with respect to prior. Uh, but when n is large, such prior can lead to overfitting. It is highly computational and inefficient. When n is large, uh, it's just a lot of samples. So the middle ground is to use uh, VAMP prior. So in general, VAMP prior looks like this. Uh, we, we sum over not all the uh, samples from our data set, but just we take uh, k inducing inputs or just k pre-sampled images from the data set. Inducing inputs is just a, a, some optimizable uh, image. It's, it's, uh, it's initialized with noise and we just optimize over it. Uh, so uh, when it's inducing inputs, it's called VAMP prior and uh, when uh, it's uh, pre-sampled images, uh, they call it VAMP prior data. Um, so it's just an approximation. Uh, we can actually see that uh, there are two ways to improve upon a vampire. First, uh, this expression, uh, the sum of all samples in the data set, is actually an integral uh, where p data x is the empirical distribution of our data. So that's exactly semi implicit distribution, right? So the aggregate the, the uh, aggregated posterior is actually a, a semi-implicit distribution. So we can uh, use a double semi-implicit variation inference uh, straightforwardly and just uh, interestingly enough we get something very similar to vampire data. So the alternative is uh, the same as in vampire data where UK is uh, some pre-sampled samples but this time we don't pre-sample them but we sample uh, new images from the data set on each optimization uh, step. So, uh, yeah, and that gives the... But why, why there's a P of Z given Z inside integral? That's uh, an alternative way to ah. improve on them prior. So that's, uh, we, we might want, to, we, we might say, say that, uh, why just re restrict us to uh, some Q5 of Z? Why, why would we put uh, the true posterior here. We might just take some neural network, uh, put some noise through it, and have uh, semi implicit distribution. Yes, but we know that uh, the, the, the optimal prior distribution is marginalized posterior, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, I, I think uh, it might be the case that uh, sometimes we may not need as large k here uh, if we have something like that. For example, if you have a very, very a uh, complex encoder, it would, be, it would be difficult to use this encoder both in the prior and the, in the posterior. So you can make the prior more simple and still obtain very good results. Uh, and also it is... Um, so it is both the pro and the con of web prior that it ties the parameters of the prior and the posterior distribution. So on the one hand, it is one of the reasons why it works so well. Uh, it uh, really prevents <coughs> Uh, underfitting. On the other hand, it is, conceptually it is pretty strange. Yeah, it's okay, let us agree that uh, if, we, if we start using different uh, single basis distribution, uh, we'll at least perform uh, not worse than if we, if we start using the, the encoder. Uh, because we're optimizing the same criteria, elbow. And now the, 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 the set of parameters with respect to which we optimize elbow is larger. 
So we shouldn't get the worst result. Uh, well, yeah. It, it, depends, it, depends, on, it yeah. depends on the complexity of uh, our uh, simplicity distribution and uh, how, how uh, easy it is to uh, actually perform the optimization problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. uh, if the best prior is is the best prior in terms of algo is somewhat bad, it is at least overfitting, does it mean that there is something wrong with the algo with the AP model? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's, I guess, well, of course, uh, we might overfit. Uh, it's, it, <laughs> well, in any uh, machine learning problem, we might overfit if our uh, model is complex enough. So, especially do not forget that, especially with training prayer, and yeah. especially, uh, yeah. do not forget that uh, ELBO is just our bound on evidence, and evidence is marginal likelihood. So, we are, anyway, we are using maximum likelihood estimation at the level of our models. And maximum likelihood method is known to, to, to overfit if there's too many parameters and uh, too, too, too little data. Uh, so yeah, uh, the overfit in this case it means that just we uh, don't uh, uh, model uh, the density on some uh, test set well. Uh, but yeah, okay, so probably this one might overfit less uh, if uh, the uh, complexity of this uh, network is uh, not so it's high. It's a bit strange because like you say first that, okay, let's try to run the prior and then, okay, let's shoot uh, the prior in the leg and don't train it well enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we know that uh, if we train it too <laughs> well, we'll yeah. get overfitting. So basically in the web prior they use a quite small k uh, quite small number of inducing inputs, like five hundred hmm? inducing inputs. Uh, and if they use, if they use larger k, they overfit. So it's always a compromise between uh, underfitting and overfitting. And currently, when we use just standard normal prior distribution and variation altering quarters, uh, we know to underfit. We know to underfit. Uh, so the idea is to make the model a bit more complicated, so that to get rid of underfitting. But of course, not so complicated in order to suffer from overfitting. Yeah, so we just, we can experimentally compare the two approaches, and we did that. Um, so here are uh, the results from the Van Prior paper. Uh, the first uh, part of the table is for a vanilla variational autoencoder. And the second part is for hierarchical variational autoencoder, which is introduced in the Van Prior uh, paper. It's, uh, a little bit different from uh, the order code that I drew on the blackboard, but so yeah, basically what we have here uh, DCV prior is uh, the one that has the fully trainable prior, and DCV aggregated is uh, using uh, the approximate posterior unit. So as we can see, with 5,000 samples, we get higher, uh, higher uh, local likelihood on test, on test set than for <coughs> van prior and van prior data. And van prior here uses 500 samples, as Dima said. Uh, but uh, if they use more samples, they overfit. And when we use uh, 5,000 samples, which is 10 times more, we don't overfit, but we fit better. What more powerful mixture for more efficient. Hmm? Because they have discrete mixture, we sends at restrict samples to K and they refit. You use infinite mixture and not to refit. Why? Uh, so I might say for example that uh, well we have more noise in our model. That prevents it from overfitting. It's some kind of regularization uh -huh. because it's no. more noisy. I can uh, for example. Uh, that's how we. Um, I. That's my intuition behind it. It's just I think uh, that uh, we don't overfit here because we resample uh, those five thousand samples on each step. That gives us uh, more variance in the gradients, and we just regularize it. And uh, that was computed on test set, right? Yeah, that's test set level. And what about uh, terrain set level likelihood? Have we compared it on different models um, or not? Mm, no, I can't. Uh, it's interesting whether do we have our overfitting to the terrain set. Well, uh, I, I think on average the 
uh, reconstruction was about the same and uh, curl eugens was lower for our method. Okay. Is this difference big enough to see the difference in the features or something? Like um, well, it's MNIST. <laughs> it's, uh, well, they're already good enough with the prior. Okay. It's, but yeah, th this increase in uh, local likelihood is large um, because, uh, well, <laughs> um, we, <laughs> So let's see the increase between uh, the standard normal prior. It's eighty six point seventy six, and here we have eighty two thirty eight. We have eighty two sixteen. But yeah, the 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 higher the marginal log likelihood, the the uh, harder it is to increase it by that, I guess. It's, yeah. So, well, it's, uh, it's significant. And what's the, what, the order of uh, standard deviation in these numbers with respect to random seed? It's, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, it's not zero, we, it's, sure, it's, but like a it's almost but zero. It's, uh, I, I think it's order of uh, Hundreds, right? No, uh, we uh, didn't uh, really compute these numbers for different random seeds because it just it takes several days to obtain one number here in this table. Okay. You, you, you computed it twice, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, you have not different big. results. Not big is like how big? I mean, like, like, this uh, is not only one big one. Zero one or yes, point zero two. Yeah. Like I mean, do we have yes. any other results in the yeah. paper? We do have toy tasks. Uh, so this is the biggest one. Yes. Yeah. Well, we believe it's. Uh, and like an expert, uh, uh, you as an expert say that okay, this is a big difference yeah. in elbow or I, what? I believe Dima. And Dima so says that it's big. So the peculiar, the peculiar thing about this experiment is that uh, the CV aggregated is a very very simple. Uh, fix for vampire data. Basically, you don't just fix your uh, inducing inputs to be a, a subset of training set, but you just resample them. Mm -hmm. So it is trivial fix, but it improves the performance by almost three uh, nuts. And the difference between vampire and vampire data is more significant. I mean. Yeah. And it, and it turns out that uh, using this fix, we even outperform them prior. So it is surprising that we, okay. it would be surprising to just use the performance of them prior. And for the DCB prior, where we don't use the aggregated uh, posterior directly, so it is quite cool that we can match the performance of them prior, of simple them prior, uh, without uh, tying the parameters of the prior and the posterior. Because one of the main so the owners of Empire say that one of the main reasons why it performs so well is because they tie these parameters together. And we can achieve it without that. And you said that uh, you need several days to compute this. Uh, is it true like, for all the methods or only for your method? Only for our method. <laughs> so Empire is like a little bit uh, more complex, but it's going to show you the formula. Show you the formula for that. Uh, so it is very easy to train with our method, so the training time is the same, but the testing time is several days. Uh, because you need to you're saying test different. time, you mean like how to compute this number in the table, yeah? Yeah, it's, yes. it's yeah. important okay. to, uh, okay. to wait it, uh, estimate. But. So you can use the model, but you can't compute the... Yes. Code, like, the yes. So we use 5,000 importance weighted samples for each object, and for each object we use 20,000 K during, test, during testing to compute this number. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> and also, like another question: What does inequality sign mean in this table? Because it's lower bound. It's lower bound on uh, the importance weighted. So is it true uh, that like only your method has this, and like the the top prior so the, the baselines don't have it? Uh, <laughs> they report the importance weighted uh, estimate of the marginal what likelihood, right? And. They are all lower bounds. Yeah, they are all lower bounds. So Our lower bound is lower. <laughs> <laughs> but then why do you have this uh, with your methods and not with their methods? 
So in their methods, they so they can use so forget about important questions. So consider just, for example, elbow, and many papers report just elbow instead of importance weighted elbow. And uh, in web prior, you can estimate elbow directly, and we can only estimate the lower bound on elbow. Therefore, therefore, we report the lower bound on elbow. And so then, you mean, but the elbow, this is elbow negative labor. So the lower the better, or the higher no, no, the no, better? The higher the better. It's negative. Negative for yeah. So it is negative. So this is just elbow. Yes. So I'm just, just trying to get, is it the bound on the right side or the wrong side? So like, is it like a, it's a little yeah. confused. So it's so you, 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 uh, elbow, you, you're trying to maximize elbow. Yes, and the so bound is better. higher than minus 82.16. And uh, the result for one prior is 82.38, which is lower than our okay. lower bound. So it means that that's the, it's good. Yes, so possibly <laughs> it is even it's more than the bound. Bound. Yeah, kind of Tell the controller how much. <laughs> it means that it's good. Okay, yeah. That's it. Okay, let us thank the speaker for a very nice talk. <laughs> so, any questions to the speaker? Or Have you tried so far? <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Not here. Not here.